Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have another incredible guest. I love getting to have people on the podcast that are actually local to where I exist because that means we're both sharing the beautiful day it is in Arizona right now. It's, it was almost 80 degrees, almost 80 degrees yesterday. Uh, I, I'm loving it. So one of the things that uh, I'm going to introduce here or one of the people, is, his name's Christopher Volk. And he's just an incredible business leader, but more importantly than being business leader, because that's we're going to get, and that's what most of the podcast is going to be about. But he's also an author, a teacher. The most important role is he's a husband and a father, and he's been married to his wife for 43 years. That is a successful business entrepreneur right there. Building three companies, taking them public, doing all that, and remaining married for 43 years. It's uncommon in our world today to see business leaders do that. Uh, even Bill Gates, like there's lots of people who they get up to that level and it doesn't work out. So it's, I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, he spends half his time here in Phoenix, Arizona, and then he spends the other half in Huntsville, Alabama. So I'm super excited, Christopher. Think, or Chris, Christopher, your thing says Christopher. So now I'm reading that. Um, anyways, where, how did you start out? Did you start out in Arizona? Did you start out in Alabama? Did you start out somewhere else? How did you start out? Where were you raised? And how did you get to where you are and accomplish as much as you have? Well, Sam, uh, good afternoon. And it's nice to see you. And it's nice to be in the same state as you are. And, and uh, it's not often I get to talk to someone on a podcast and we're just a few miles away from each other. So uh, so it's good to be here. Um, I started off, my I was born in New York City. I was born in New York Hospital in Manhattan. And uh, I grew up right in the middle of Manhattan. So I grew up on 73rd Street on the east side between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And uh, my father was an attorney and uh, he dealt with uh, ships. So he was a maritime attorney dealing with ship collisions. And I uh, went to school in Manhattan, uh, grade school, and then uh, uh, high school elsewhere and ended up in college in Virginia. and. So I grew up in kind of a heady environment because I grew up with uh, parents that were pretty accomplished. And uh, uh, and I grew up in a city surrounded with some of the smartest people around. I mean, New York City, pound for pound, does have a lot of uh, smart people and it, and it attracts people from all over the country. I mean, they come from everywhere and all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and so I uh, went to university and when I got out, I, uh, I guess the most formative thing that happened to me when I got out was that uh, nobody wanted to hire me. And uh, I, I studied European history and French language. I didn't study anything like business or whatnot. I mean, uh, I took my four years to study anything I wanted to, and that was kind of what I wanted to study at the time. And, uh, and so I looked for a job, and it was in 1981. And, and for anybody who is listening, if you were around then or looking for a job then, it was a really tough marketplace. Actually, it was kind of around 1980 uh, when I got my first job. So, um, and uh, uh, there was a recession, there was a lot of inflation going on. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a difficult time. It was probably, from a job seeking perspective, it was worse in 2007, eight, uh, and, and uh, the Great Recession here. So, I uh, made a decision if I didn't have a job, I was going to uh, just take anything. And I ultimately just started selling clothes in a retail store uh, in New York City, which was my first uh, real job. And uh, um, ultimately, I decided I just didn't want to live in New York. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and took a job with the same uh, retailer uh, working in a different store in Atlanta, <clears throat> selling clothes. And I uh, and I had applied to lots of places for jobs. I actually had something like 350 
uh, written uh, job applications that I had done, and I'd been turned down for pretty much every one of them. And uh, and so I decided that I had to make my own way. I had to figure out what I was going to do, and I had no clue. I mean, most people that graduate from college today still really don't have a lot of clues. Um, what they do have that I didn't have is they have a lot of people looking for them to hire them for jobs. It's it's rare for somebody to go through the experience that I had to go through. But uh, um, but the experience I went through kind of forced me to actually step back and think about what do I want to do? What's my career going to be? And I decided that I wanted to be in business. And I decided that a good place to do this would be in a bank. If, if I could get some bank to hire me and I could learn about lots of companies and lots of businesses out there, I could kind of decide maybe what I wanted to do. And so I started taking night classes in business at Georgia State University, which is the main university and uh, public university in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And I uh, was taking accounting classes and Ultimately, I got a bank, I convinced a bank to hire me into their training program. And uh, that was in 1980. And, and from that point onward, I just worked hard. I mean, I, uh, uh, I'd been obviously kicked to the street pretty easily because I graduated from a fairly decent school, but with uh, uh, a degree that uh, people found not uh, to be that useful. And um, uh, I was... Uh, uh, I'm not going to take it lying down. So I basically uh, took my competitive spirits and went to work and I worked really hard. And I uh, decided early on that if I wanted to be in leadership in a bank, the, the thing you had to do was to really understand commercial lending. And, and uh, so I became really good at reading financial statements. I went through the whole training program and I'm still kind of a credit geek today. I mean, I uh, uh, analyze financials every now and then and write articles uh, uh, that I publish in Seeking Alpha, which is a website that you can go to that uh, basically democratizes research on companies. And, um, and I worked in banking for six years and ultimately basically uh, decided I didn't want to be in banking. And you have to make some self-evaluation decisions about why you don't want to be there. I mean, I had various reasons we could talk about that, but uh, uh, I learned a basic lesson, which was that not all businesses are created equal. Some businesses are just flat better than others. And, and one, of my one of my customers when I was in Atlanta was a company that was based here in Arizona. And uh, they offered me a position to come out here. And so for no pay raise or no change in compensation at all, I just, I uh, uh, packed up the car with my wife and a moving truck, and uh, we moved out here to Arizona and um, uh, started working here in 1986. And uh, uh, it took me a, a while, but by 1992, I was uh, helping them to raise money, and I just suggested that they take it public. And I uh, helped them organize the company to <clears throat> model it out to take the company public. And we listed the company a couple of years later uh, in 1994 on the New York Stock Exchange. And I rose to be president of the, of the business and, uh, and ran it for seven years as a public company until we sold it to GE Capital. And GE at the time was run by a guy named Jack Walsh, who was a very famous uh, uh, business person and, and celebrity. And uh, it was the last deal that Jack ever did and he, uh, at uh, GE, the last company he bought. And I stayed there for about a year and a half and then left. And, uh, and that's when you make sort of the big decision as to what do you want to do? I mean, I've been uh, president of a public New York Stock Exchange company. What do I want to do? And I made the decision to start another company. And so I made that leap to be an entrepreneur uh, in uh, 2002. Uh, and uh, so 2003, we raised the money to start our, uh, another company, took it public in 2004. and. Um, I would run that company and later on, 10 years later, I took another company public and um, listed that. So I've done it three times. And uh, uh, and last one, I just stepped down from and uh, at the end of uh, 2021, and I wrote my book uh, on business and um, it's about how businesses create wealth and how the richest people got that way. And, uh, uh, and now I'm talking uh, on podcasts, I'm writing articles, and I'm trying to help people who are thinking about starting companies and what it takes to be uh, successful at it. And having done it three times, I thought I was in a good position to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I have tons and tons of questions. I know already, um, just based off of what questions I have, we're not going to get to all of them today. Uh, but 
I'm guessing a lot of them are actually answered in your book. So if you also are like, man, I have questions after hearing that, uh, that list of everything Chris has done, where can I get more information? Go look at his book, go buy it, go read it. Don't just buy it, read it. Okay. If you just buy it and it sits on yourself, it didn't help you at all. You know, there's, there's an old saying that the person who can read, but doesn't read is no better off than the person who can't read. So, you know, don't be that person, but get the book and read it. Uh, Cause what I love about this podcast and the, the focus of this, as far as fuel your legacy is the idea that this stuff is going farther than what we are, than, than the immediate. And that we're talking about principles that can guide our lives long-term. And so when we're talking about this, think about that, think about what Chris has accomplished and what other areas of your life can this be applied? Cause yes, we're going to talk about it in a construct of business, some of it, but there's a lot of, principles that apply everywhere in life. If you want to be successful anywhere in life, uh, success leaves clues and it, uh, it's across all areas. So let's go back to uh, New York just really quick. How, did you have any siblings that were born in your family or were you an only child? No, I have a younger sister. She's four years younger. Okay. So one, one younger sister, but far enough away that did you guys spend a lot of time together? Was there a lot of interaction or was it pretty um, almost like separate childhood type situation as we got older it became more like separate childhoods uh, at four years doesn't seem like a lot but you know that when you know when you're four years apart one person's in high school and the other is not one's in college when the other one's not so you uh you you, you uh, start to part ways pretty early on yeah it's it's almost like two uh single fa- child households almost I, i'm the seventh of eleven and we, I see the same split in my family where there's almost five families, complete separate family units in that 11 children because it spans 20 years. And it's just, there's just different families, like the oldest three, then the oldest five, then the, then the next three, and then the next five. And, you know, just like, anyways, it's just kind of a fascinating thing. So uh, I think that's important because a lot of times you think, oh, well, being a single child, maybe you get more attention. Well, how what how did that split happen when you're like when your parents are both accomplished and working? How much attention did you feel like you got, or was it like that, that age is still kind of latchkey children age? So uh, in the in the sixties to the the nineties, what was that like growing up in New York in that environment? I was definitely sort of like a latchkey child. I mean, my my mother would be uh, off working, my dad was working. Uh, I was taking just the regular New York City buses to school from from the time I was going to the third grade. So, uh, uh, really, kind of on your own and uh, coming home, doing your homework by yourself, that kind of stuff. So, uh, finding out, you know, going over to friends' houses and playing and stuff like that. I was doing it all on my own. So I had a, a lot of independence, and that's unusual today, honestly. For for today's kids, you hear that there's just a lot of times less independence than uh, uh, our generation, my generation would have had. But uh, uh, I think that that kind of independence really helps you to be a self-starter. It helps you to realize that kind of you're in charge of your life. And uh, uh, and so that helped me later on as I got into business. Yeah, no, it's, I don't know how, I, I have a three children, a seven-year-old, five-year-old, and a uh, two-year-old daughter, and I don't understand how to create that independence. I also was raised very, very independent, ran around the town. We were homeschooled. I don't know that my parents knew where I was half the time, and, and they were both working. And so it's interesting now, me working from home, so I'm pretty much always home with my kids, or, or my wife is, one of us always is. So it's interesting to say, how do you create that independence and foster that independence at a young age? Not just, let's say we don't care, but then the neighborhood cares if there's little kids running around more so than I feel like the neighborhood I grew up in cared. So it's an interesting thing to how to foster that independence. Do you have children and and how did you do that with your children? Pass on those same lessons. Yeah, so uh, I tried really hard to make it so they were as independent as possible. Um, uh, We have our our, uh, two children, a boy and a girl. Um, The uh, youngest is a boy i'll start with him i mean he, uh he got type 1 diabetes when he was six and uh which is which is a uh, chronic illness and uh requires you to be on insulin for basically the rest of your life and uh and as a parent 
uh, dealing with any child with any chronic illness, it becomes a family illness. It's not just their illness. It's it's uh, becomes part of what you do. And one of the finest things that we did for him was to send him off to Massachusetts to be a, a camp counselor, first a camper, then a camp counselor, a camp with, uh, uh, that dealt with diabe- diabetic kids you know, that had type 1 diabetes. And so uh, sending him 2,000 miles away across the country, working with other kids with uh, uh, diabetes, gave him a sense of huge independence. And it was uh, far enough away from us that uh, uh, it allowed him to be his own person. And I think that uh, uh, with him and with our daughter, we were very intent on trying to give them that kind of experience where they could do things on their own. Um, uh, as they got older, they went. They were going to uh, college. One of the, one of the important things you do with kids is to make sure they're getting lots of work experience. So even in high school and in college, we were giving them, um, pushing them to getting internships, uh, work in different places. In the case of our son, he was doing uh, internships uh, in New York City, for example, um, uh, and all that gave him a, a sense of independence. Our daughter was more local. Uh, but uh, again, doing uh, work on her own. And I think that this is so important as you're having kids. I always tell people that I interview for college and I interview a lot of applicants going to the college that I attended. And I will say to them that, that what you do in the summer is those internships are some of the most important things. They're almost more important than what you major in in, in terms of getting a job out of college. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I just think, so how old was your son when you sent him to Boston? Um, as a camper, when we sent him to Boston, he was probably uh, nine or ten, you know. Um, uh, and then, uh, and so I would get on an airplane with him, and uh, we'd fly him there and fly him back. But but basically, he'd be there by himself. And then, for how long? He, uh, a month. A month. I love it. So, which doesn't seem like a lot, but but it's a month, and and, uh, and, and so you have a not a short amount a nine of time. Or 10-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, so, and I think that these are things which which help people to grow. And and by the way, it's not just to have independence, but to have grit. You know, um, and grit's a different issue. I mean, uh, and you're trying to uh, rear children that end up being uh, self supporting and and have uh, uh, some self starting and some some get up and go and some just grit, so they can basically tolerate failure, they can uh, tolerate adversity, uh, and they can work their way through it. And, uh, and so much of this is just important. It's important in business, it's important in life. It's certainly, for me, uh, uh, I had some grit to begin with, and I guess I used it because if you get turned down by 350 people looking for a job, and, um, it, you know, short story, uh, when I was working in retail I, uh, in New York City, uh, there was a gentleman that I worked with. Um, and he and I started at the same time, and and we had fairly similar backgrounds. And he he likewise has had a hard time finding a job, and uh, and he ended up staying at this retailer and played out his whole career at the same retailer for I don't know thirty years or something like that. Um, and uh, uh, meanwhile, I was uh, going to Atlanta. I was putting myself through night business school. I was getting a job at a bank, starting pretty low. I was probably making less money than he was uh, uh, doing retail in New York City for a while. Um, and then uh, ultimately uh, rising from the bank to work for a company and then uh, rising up to be president and so on. And so it's a, it's a sign that the, this is not like a rigged game here. This is a game where even if you have some advantages, and this, this is a person who was a college graduate who's got some advantages, but unless you really work hard and uh, harness your life, you're going to be uh, treated just like anybody else. I mean, and so he, he's in retail and I ended up running three public companies. So it's a place where you could see life can diverge based upon what people do. Yeah, based on choices. So um, I, I'm going to bring all these questions back to uh, business because that's what I really want to talk about that. But I want to ask one final question here about your children. Um, and it's just based off of my experience. But I, I mentioned I was the seventh of 11 kids. When I was about 12 or 13, um, I really had basically told my parents, look, we don't really, it, it might've been 14. I really don't know when it was. It was young. I told my parents, look, I don't need you as parents anymore. Like legally, I can't earn certain amounts of money, but like, stop trying to parent me. I'm a grown man. Let me do my thing. And this was at 14. And thankfully, thank goodness, my parents like 
accepted that and they treated me as an equal, which meant, well, now I don't have to carry, drive you around when you want to. Now you get to go find your own way. You know, there was, there was some initial hardship there, but it, it was the best thing that ever happened for my relationship with my parents. And it was the best thing I think that ever happened to me. When you're trying to raise independence and foster independence in children, especially like you send them away for a month or two months. And that, that experience I had with my parents, that was right after they and my oldest brother had gone to France for a month and left the, I don't know, the youngest, let's see, there was 11 kids minus three, nine, no, eight, eight of us, I don't know, it's too many. Left the, the youngest eight of us home. And I think the oldest kid at that point was like 17, 18 years old. So it's like, we're, we're all managing our life. They're in literally Europe for a month and there's an envelope of money in the cover. And that was like, we managed our life. So then you allow somebody to have this level of independence. But then when they come back, at the end of the day, they're still children and you're still their parent. And they still have, there's still now rules where before they were kind of self managing, they still have to exist inside of the ecosystem of your family. How did you like? continue to foster the independence after they have that independence and not squash it when they get back and be like, well, actually there are rules and you don't get to do whatever the hell you want. You have to obey me. Like, how did you balance that? I don't know how, I'm, again, I've got three kids and I'm not sure where the balance is. Um, how did you balance that in your family? Uh, and then I'm gonna ask about bring all this into business, but how did you balance it in your family? Yeah, I think that you have certain expectations and they're just basic expectations and your kids grow up knowing you have certain expectations. Um, uh, we expected them to uh, go to school and, and to do their homework and to uh, get out of high school. We expected them that they would go to, to university. Um, we expected that they would get to university and they graduate in four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so there were certain expectations that we had that were kind of part of the rule set. So if you think about uh, your family, um, you're giving kids a certain amount of independence, but then there's kind of a, a, a framework around that independence where there's a, a guidelines or goalposts that they got to stay within. And, uh, and so we created the sort of the goalposts that they had to stay within. And then uh, within that set of parameters, and they could do kind of what they wanted to do. Um, and so we gave them a, a fair amount of independence and we didn't uh, try to micromanage them. That is difficult for me. Maybe it's because they're seven and five and two right now. And I don't know what my parents did. Like we were independent uh, a lot of time. And then whenever they wanted to be in control, it felt like you expect us to be independent whenever you don't want to care about us. But then when you care about something, we're instantly not allowed to be independent anymore. And it's just a hard balance. So that's why I'm right. trying to understand so, this from somebody who's experienced it, not just in the personal family level, but I think a lot of the family stuff that we deal with, it's a great... If you don't like somebody in business, you can fire them. You don't have to actually continue to work with an intolerable person in business. In your family, you can't fire your child. You it, It's the best place to learn how to negotiate and communicate and create <laughs> change with, some, with somebody that you can't just remove. And that's why I'm focusing so much on this because I know it applies to business. I know it transfers to how you were able to take three companies public. So I wanna understand how does the average person who maybe is not gonna go take their thing public, how do they foster these same identities and skill sets at a level that everybody almost is going to be engaged. Right. With. Well, I mean, and we'll get into business in a second, but there, there's some rules that, that uh, apply to both. And one of the things today, and there are books that you, I mean, you, you study this stuff, so you probably know this more than me, but, but uh, um, there are books that have been written quite recently about uh, uh, our tendency to sort of overprotect children today. I mean, that they tend to be, you know, uh, I mean, there's, there's a sort of a level of hovering that parents can do. And it's important that kids be allowed to fail. I mean, uh, kids have to be uh, allowed not to succeed in certain stuff. They, they have to be allowed to pursue certain uh, dreams and certain thoughts and, and have them not turn out because that's kind of what creates a certain amount of uh, strength. I mean, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing. Um, and and if you allow your children to experience that, 
um, then uh, they become just uh, much better because they, they acknowledge that certain people do things better than they do. Uh, they start to become more self-aware about what they can do, what they can't do. And self-awareness is a big part of being uh, a corporate leader. I mean, it's, it's part of assembling a team and knowing what my skills are and where I really need help. No, I, I agree. So let's, let's transfer this conversation a little bit into business. Um, learning these managerial skills, or I, I just call them managerial skills, but like understanding communication, understanding how to allow somebody enough freedom. Because the, the last thing you want in a business, and you, you've seen this, I'm sure, where you have business leaders that are hovering business leaders. They want to be have their fingers in every part of their business. And you're never taking a company public. You're never even really getting off the ground to 10, 15 employees if you have to be involved in everything. Like it has to be a mindset shift where you no longer want to be self-employed. You actually want to own a system that can exist without you. And that's difficult because you have to trust that, well, one, you have to be humble enough to know that you're actually probably not the best thing that happened to that system. <laughs> you might be the best idea, maybe, or a good idea, but like you can't do every role in that business the best. And that's for a, a small business owner, it's so tempting to be like, well, I want to build it my way. It's like, well, your way isn't duplicatable enough to be like, it doesn't matter if your way is better. If it can't be duplicated, it doesn't matter. We need to go something that's duplicatable. So talk about that. Like, how do you allow and, and foster enough independence that people are able to innovate and, and actually outperform you while still, again, creating those goalposts, creating those guidelines of like, this is what our the entity represents that we're trying to move forward. Right. So when you're starting a business, there are always one or two or maybe more people that think about starting a business. And, um, and there's, there's kind of a pathway to this. So when you're starting a business, the, the, the pathway really starts with the customer that you're trying to um, attract and the product or service that you think you want to provide. I mean, uh, and, and usually the initial leaders of a business are thinking about that direction. We, we have a market, there are these customers out there, here's a product or service we can do for them. And they're conceiving about why a customer would want to have that product and why they'd be willing to pay for that product. Um, and once you get to that point, uh, which usually is a first, you know, first few leaders of a business, um, then, you start to think about how do you organize the business. So you're not like organizing the business necessarily day one. Your first day, your first day one experience is what are we going to do for our customer? And then now you're going to create a business around that solution or product that you're providing for a customer. And uh, and that's where you decide which of you is going to accept which role in the business. And um, and finding people to fill other roles that you think need to be filled. And, uh, and in my case, one of the things that really was helpful to me was that I uh, knew the people that I was working with really intimately. I knew what they were really good at um, and uh, I knew how much I could trust them. So I'd been there, you know, I'd been working with them in an, an employed capacity for a while and I, you know, a lot of those people left with me to go start something new. And um, for people that are bringing in people that are sort of relative uh, newcomers to, to a, a business or an idea, it, it takes some knowledge of that person to spend time with them to really get a feel for what they can do, what they're good at, um, so that you know what needs to be delegated to them. And as a CEO, uh, so much of this starts with self-awareness about what you're good at and what you're not as good at and what other people can really lend to the business. And um, uh, so, for example, I'm not the most detail-oriented guy. I mean, uh, it really helped it if I was surrounded by people that were immersed in every single number, every single facet, every single document in the business, all the legal documents of the business, uh, it was going to be very helpful to me. I was um, very good at modeling out the business and conceptualizing the business, uh, but it really helped me to, to have other folks around me that could fill in those gaps. I am a pretty good business development person. 
I've raised a lot of money over the years, uh, but there are people on business development that are better than I am. And so I would surround myself with people that were very good on the new business development side uh, to be able to do a better job than, than I would be able to do. And my view of leadership teams is that the skill sets required of a CEO aren't universal. I mean, uh, uh, there's not such one thing where you say this this person is a CEO person. Um, uh, so most a lot of CEO people tend to be very, very uh, uh, effervescent. There are people that are uh, strong business development types. I would say I'm not really like that. I mean, I started off being a credit geek. So so I'm coming into it from being a little bit more geekish than like most CEOs. And um, play uh, differently based on the widget or the company and the purpose of the company, right? So if yeah. you're trying to sell iPhones, maybe that's not the thing that you're supposed to be the CEO of that company, but you might be a really great CEO of a different company. Um, that's also true. You know, I mean, uh, uh, so for example, it's hard to be a marketing person and be CEO of a finance company, for example. Um, yeah. So um, uh, I was a finance person who was basically CEO of a finance company. So I was good at that part. I mean, I understood that really well. Uh, but I, you know, the other people who have assumed the position I had um, have different skill sets. That's not really the, the, the important thing is that when you uh, assemble a leadership team, these are people that are like four, four or five people that have complementary skill sets. They work really well together and they blend well together and they don't all have the same skill five times over. They have different skills that kind of gel uh, and create a whole. And, and so you're looking at how to fill up that hole. And as a CEO, if you're the founder, uh, you get to kind of um, wave the baton and, and figure out what roles people go into. If you're doing it with other people and you're more on an equal basis and you all sort of figure out who the best people are going to be as you, as you put together your business. But um, it's, it's really important to, to do this because step one is, you know, the customer, you know, uh, step two in business is trying to create a business model that's going to be around that um, uh, solution that you're providing. And the business models is where a lot of wealth gets created. So if you think about uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they start Google. Um, Google's idea was just to make web searches better, you know, make them easier. Um, and not only make them easier, but make it so that anybody could search whatever they wanted to search. So it, would, it put a lot of power in individuals' hands to do that. Um, great idea. So then the question is, how do you transform that idea into a business model? You know, mm -hmm. that's the key, right? I mean, how do you do this? I mean, and that second step is what made, uh, in, you know, is what helped make these guys billionaires, right? Um, is figuring out how to harness this great idea. Now, how do I turn that into a really good business? And, and, and of course, Google is one of the best businesses ever created. So uh, my businesses were good. Not, not as good as Google, but we did a, a great job. We created uh, plenty of people that uh, today have nice net worths. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. That's awesome. So I have a question about when you're building this team, um, <clears throat> There's there's a there's a conversation of gelling and complementary and complementary could mean something different to different uh, people with different thicknesses of skin. We'll call it I don't know like uh, emotional capacity uh, might might change what that word means. So uh, my my question is how often is there conflict in that management team where yes you're bringing in people who you value, you need their experience, you value their experience, you understand they're an absolute expert in their field, but maybe the, the direction they see something going or the, the view of how to accomplish or get to the end goal is, is pretty contrasted between five different people, five different perspectives, all came from five different similarities. Yes, there's success principles that are true across all success, but how you get to that end goal in the, in the business modeling might be different. And as that they're working those out, how much conflict is there? And I'm saying conflict, again, not in a bad way, but complimentary discussion of like, I think we should do it this way. We should do it this way. How much of that conversation is happening in a public company where uh, they, they have some real people to answer to and the board of advisors? I mean, you see, I, I'm going to take Disney, for example, uh, where you have, um, it seems like there could be competing views of the direction of the company. And some people are winning on some issues, some people are losing on others. 
and that's causing um, a lack of clarity to the the public base of the company of like what is the direction of this and so then how much conflict is good versus how much is like no we all need to be unified we all need to have the same vision and we're not going to allow people in who see our company going a different direction or changing at all like how much is good and how much when does it tip over and say hey we need to get rid of that guy that ceo was not good bring in somebody else who sees our vision so i think that um confrontation is really good um i thought you would that's why i said you're calling it complimentary (laughs) but you probably have thick skin and you can have somebody vehemently disagree with you and you'll be like well that's nice let's talk let's keep talking about it where in the world we live in today I don't feel like very many people see confrontation as a good thing. They think you think right. you're evil and it's not true. And we need that in our lives. So how do we no. shape our mind around that is kind of what I'm trying to get at here. Right. I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's, for example, today, if you're, you're at, uh, uh, with, out with, with people that you don't know very well, um, there are certain subjects that people just do not like to talk about. I mean, politics being at the top of the list because... The politics today tends to get so divisive. Um, um, and uh, for your listeners, I, I would say that I tend to be of, of, of the view that our um, differences are not near so great as they appear. Sure. Um, but that's a, a, we could spend more time on that. But, but uh, I think that, uh, uh, but I think that when people have disagreements, you can be, you can have disagreements without being disagreeable. You know, um, uh, you can have points of view uh, without being um, obnoxious. I mean, uh, well, and a different point of view doesn't have to be a character flaw. It can be a different perspective. Correct. You know, um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, I get nervous about uh, uh, today's generation of people bought into this world where there's a, a lot of divisiveness on issues. And, and the natural response to that is to not be engaged, to not uh, want to... Uh, have confrontation with anybody because uh, they want to, you want to, you want to, you want confrontation avoidance. But really, when you think about a business, I mean, uh, any business. So our, our business was in the, what I would do for, for a living was um, uh, buy a lot of real estate locations that were rented to businesses on a long term basis for their uh, business purposes. So, for example, we focused on we owned lots of chain restaurants where the the, the franchisees or the restaurant chains would uh, be our tenants. We owned fitness clubs. We owned uh, you know, early child education. We owned uh, veterinary clinics. I mean, all kinds of different freestanding square box properties that were rented to businesses on a long term basis. And when you're doing this, you know, when you're making an investment like this, you're taking risk. I mean, um, you're you're when we would buy real estate, we would be taking risk. And is this person going to be able to pay us for the next 10, 15, 20 years? Um, uh, is the business worth it? Are they viable? I mean, what what are the risks in doing this? Are we paying too much for the real estate and so on? And we're in the business of taking risk. I mean, that's one of the things that we were in the business of doing. And when you're going to take risk, people should argue about it. I mean, they should have <laughs> <laughs> some points of view on it. I mean, uh, and it's okay. Uh, and uh, and by the way, you know, there's, it's not like you can put in um, uh, all the characteristics of our investments into some AI algorithm and it's going to spit out saying, yes, you should do this deal. No, you should not do this deal. I mean, there are so many qualitative factors that go into this. I mean, including, do you like the management team? Do you like the, the people you're doing business with? Uh, I mean, so there, there are uh, qualitative and quantitative factors that go into making these kinds of investments. And... Uh, and you can, it's okay to have an opinion um, and you should have an opinion. And well, it's almost uh, worse if so, you are with people who don't have opinions and it's like, do you right. even care? Are you like pick a side one way or the other? Cause if you're just milk toast, I can't help you. Like why did so, we even so, bring you if you're going to be so a let me give you, <laughs> Let me give you an idea. So, so uh, we sold our first company to GE Capital. Uh, GE at the time was the largest most valuable company in the United States of America. Um, uh, it had been on the Dow Jones Industrial Ad Index since it was created. I mean, uh, so, uh, so it was the longest standing member of the index. It was a triple A rated company. So one of a handful of companies in the world that was triple A. 
And I decided early on that the company had problems. It had real problems. And, and a lot of them were cultural. Um, and, and so one of the cultural issues that was wrong with them was that uh, if, you would, if you were in uh, a room with a lot of uh, GE people, if you complained a lot, if you sit there and say, well, this isn't working. If somebody were to say to you, Sam, how's your day? And you said, you know, today's just not working out for me really well. Um, you would be uh, potentially viewed by your counterparts as being a negative person. I mean, uh, uh, Sam's being, he's just not a team player. He's a negative guy. Um, I want to go to my employees and say, well, Sam, how are you doing? And, and you would have no problem saying, Today's not my best day. You know, this department's not working well. I've got these issues. I gotta, you know, uh, I gotta fix this stuff. And because all companies have things in them that are not working right. And it's really important for people to be very, very uh, uh, open and receptive to this idea that things need to be fixed all the time. They need to be tweaked. They need to be made better all the time. And and it's okay to complain. I, I love if I'm talking to one of my employees and they say, you know, the, today's not working out really well for me, Chris, because this isn't working well and we really need to fix this better. And, and I'm, I'm working on ways to, to, to make this process better. I love that stuff. Um, if the minute people are too positive in a business, or the minute you try to sort of create this air of false positivity where everybody's going and you say, Chris, how's your day? And, and the answer I give is, you know, if today were any better, it would be illegal or something like that. Yeah. Uh, if I were to give that kind of uh, canned response, then uh, or, or say today's just fantastic all the time, um, then uh, what's, what's happening is you're creating an error of false positivity. And what's really happening is that the people running the business are actually just this handful of people up top that are running the business. And everybody else down there is basically a bobblehead doll. They're nod, nodding up and down. Oh yeah, everything's just great all the time. And, um, and those kinds of cultures are gonna fail because two people up top or three people up top can't make it work. You know, And there's not enough communication that's being pushed down and they're not letting people below them come up with ideas to make improvements and everybody's afraid to talk, you know? Um, and so you want to have a company where people are totally open to talking and they're, they're no thought police and there's nobody that's going to hold your ideas against you. And to create that atmosphere requires trust. I mean, you know, your, your staff has to trust that if they say something that's really on their mind, that you're not going to be offended by it. And uh, I worked really hard to try to create that kind of trust. Yeah. I think that's huge. And again, that, that's something that relates in every aspect of your life, whether you're building a friend group, whether you're building, like going to whatever church you choose to participate in, any, any area where there is a level of um, you're not allowed to share your, your, your feelings or there's only safe people to share your feelings with, then I think it is difficult because you remove the ability to innovate. You remove the ability to, to improve. I want to share this story because I think it comes down to uh, so, so, well, it's just a funny story that happened yesterday with my son, but it, it talks to me, it speaks to how well are we transferring this and, and allowing the youngest generations to understand what's happening in the world around them. And so yesterday we decided that we were going to go to the merry-go-round thing in the mall. And in the past, when we'd been going, it was a dollar per ride, right? So my wife's like, let's go. I've got seven bucks in my wallet let's just go take the kids for a ride. So we show up and they've raised the price to $5 per ride per person. And so I show up, I'm like, a minute and a half. I don't know if it's worth my five bucks today, but we're already there. We already drove over there. And my wife's like, man, if I had known it was five bucks, I wouldn't have suggested. This is like, they'd five X the cost of this 30 second ride or you know, it's probably a minute and a half. But, um, so we, we talk about it. And we're like, whatever, we're already here. Let's just do it. This one time we're done coming, but this is our one time. We're, gonna, we're not going to tell our kids, no, they're two, three, and five, and they're super excited, bouncing up and down. So we, we get on the ride. We have the ride. We come home, and this morning we're, we're discussing, like, uh, our five-year-old's like, I want to go back to the merry-go-round. It was so fun. Why can't I go ride again? And we're like, because they, they, they raised the prices to the point that, like, I don't know why they did that, but now we're not going because it's ridiculous. We could have ridden another ride in the same mall for the same amount of money and gotten uh, 30 minutes of the ride versus this other one. So if we go back, we'll do the other one. And uh, so then my seven-year-old, he's sitting there painting and he's like, 
But why did they do that? Now they're going to lose business. And so I'm like, okay, explain. He's like, well, if they raise the prices, then less people are going to go. Why don't they lower the prices so they can get more people to come? I was like, that could work, but there's still going to be people who show up just like we did because they thought it was cheaper. They're going to show up and they're going to pay the price. He's like, but then they're never going to come back. So it's like, it's cool to see these, even a seven-year-old can understand basic business. They can understand basic equations of where's the value that you're offering and is the environment that you're creating sustainable for that value? Or is, are you making the, the environment unsustainable? Right. And it's not, this isn't like rocket science. This is like basic. That's crazy. I'm not doing that. I'll do it once because I'm here, but it's not happening again type of conversations. I think that that's really, really valuable. Um, so when you're raising, when you were take, you took the first company public, what did you learn from taking the first company public that made going, taking the next two companies public easier to transition with this knowledge of, okay, the, this is basically how these, what these things are looking for, what the public's looking for. How did it make it easier to create that value equation for the next business and the next business? And maybe you go do another one. I mean, you've only been off for three years, right? So maybe you're like, let's go get in again, you know? Um, you look young to me, so I don't think you're ready to retire by any. <laughs> well, no, and I'm doing this, and I really enjoy. I, I would like to um, inspire other people to start businesses, and I would like to have people that are running businesses understand what it takes to make those businesses more valuable. So, which is why I, I uh, took the time to write the book, and which is you know one of the reasons I uh, uh, do podcasts and uh, write articles and whatnot, and. Uh, um, I think, I think, you know, we all go through uh, our lives and the number one thing that helps us both in our jobs and elsewhere is trying to make a difference for other people, you know? So as you become uh, a CEO of a business or as you become really good at something, you're able to make a difference for more and more people. And so uh, uh, so I'm trying to tra take the uh, skills I've had and try to repurpose them a little bit or redirect them a little bit to uh, um, try to make a difference for a much broader group of people and not just the people that work for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, so that's why we're talking to each other today. So, um, so what, what was the question you wanted to go uh, into? Like what, what, dude, I'm out of time. Unfortunately, I don't, okay. I don't know what to do. We need to have another one of these calls. I'm not kidding. Get it in okay. our schedule, um, for like next week or something. If you can, I want to finish this conversation. I don't have time to, we only have two minutes left. Um, but I want to know the answer to this. So you guys are going to have to listen to the next podcast to get the answer of this. What did he learn from taking the first company public that made it easier right. to duplicate that and do it again and again and again? Because again, these same skills wow. that we learn in our life, we're able to transfer them. And I think one of the biggest knowledge gaps that we have in society right now is there's a lot of people who have a lot of skills and they're amazing at a lot of things but they don't understand what he was talking about, the business development. Okay, you have this great idea, make information free to everybody for Google. How do we monetize this? How do we make it useful for our lives? And maybe the skill for you isn't gonna turn into money, but it's still gonna turn into value creation. And that's what his book's about. Like, how do you create value? Value sometimes is money. Sometimes it's not value, but value creation, when you understand that you have skill sets and they can be transferred. If you're a teacher, I was talking to a teacher, well, not a teacher, she's a, She's a, a waitress. I'm going to meet with her tomorrow. So look, look, what do you love about being a waitress? I love helping people. I love problem solving. I love helping them find what they need. I love hearing people's stories. I love interacting. I was like, look, you've been working as a waitress for 20 years. And you're barely, you, after 20 years, you were able to buy it. You were able to sign on a house. The bank still owns your house. We were able to sign on a house. And you're debt free, which is awesome. I'm happy for you and you're thrilled. But you're the best waitress you know. If you take those same skill sets and apply them in a different industry, you could have 10, 20, 30 times the amount of money. Because the skill set is what's transferable. And so how do you create that same value and where you create that value changes the return on that value. So this is where we get value creation, same problem solved for somebody, small problem, small result, big problem for that person, big solve, big income. I'm on a, I'm on a podcast, baby. So anyways, I'm, I'm so excited to have the, the future of this conversation. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but we just need to get it scheduled. Thank you so much. Uh, if, wh where's the best place to get your book? 
for if people want to. Um, so uh, well, you can get it on Amazon or you can get you can uh, download it electronically. The book is called The Value Equation, and it's a uh, business guide to wealth creation for entrepreneurs, uh, leaders and investors. And you can also go to my website, which is www.thevalueequation.com. And you can find me also on LinkedIn, too. Awesome. I love it. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate this conversation. I have got to this much of a whole page of notes. So I really have so many more questions. Okay, Sam. Pleasure. Uh, okay. Enjoyed it. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.